Come on, come on, come on right here. Courage, hope, resiliency. All carried on the backs of each individual seeking refuge and peace. There is a human story that is at the heart of this. Victims of war, persecution, and political instability. Most are women and children. We are just want to continue our life. The need seems overwhelming. Behind each one of these people is a whole world, a whole life. There are no simple solutions, but we all have the divine ability to make a difference. When I saw how much one person could do, or five people could do, or 100 people could do. The LDS Church issued a call to help the powerless. It is our hope that you will prayerfully determine what you can do and minister to those in the greatest need. The reality of these situations must be seen to be believed. Over the next hour, you'll see how that call was answered. Immediately it touched us and we knew we had to do something. Learn how people use their unique talents and skills to serve. Everything that I've learned and done has led to what I'm doing here. And see how those who stepped forward to help were also rescued in unimaginable ways. I don't think we'll ever look at our lives the same as we used to. Join us as we explore the struggles, the triumphs of those coming to the rescue. It's an amazing thing to see how God loves these people. The waters of the Mediterranean, calm now. They hold heartbreaking tales of desperation, bravery, and a great test for humanity. One image stood out. On September 2, 2015, the body of Ilan Kurdi, a three-year-old Syrian boy, washed up on a Turkish beach. The image provoked feelings of helplessness and outrage, but it also inspired people to take action. I, I read online about these massive volunteer movements. Including an LDS woman in Arkansas who had just graduated from EMT school. I had no idea how much I would need that training. Um, and I had no idea that within a matter of months I would find myself in a refugee camp you know, with seven to 8,000 people with no medical care at night. Crystalline Steed Brown, an inexperienced medic with a humanitarian's heart, headed to Greece. I was planning three weeks. Nothing could have prepared her for Moria Camp, located on the island of Lesbos. In 2015, this gateway to Europe was the center of the refugee crisis. It was really quite overwhelming to be in a situation with such acute needs absolutely everywhere you looked. Crystalline often worked through the night caring for babies, the sick and elderly. Elder Patrick Kieran saw her in action. She administered first aid to those in most critical medical need. And recounted the experience during general conference in April 2016. She, as so many like her, has been a literal ministering angel. When Crystalline's family in Provo realized she wasn't coming home as planned, they decided to join her. My dad and my brother came over. I thought I'd go help pass out bananas and help refugees. Instead, they too found themselves in the middle of life and death. If you were only there once to see one boat come in, it would change your life. Adam Steed helped dozens of people clear the rocks and make it to land. I never expected that grown men would just look at me and just fall into my hands. 18-year-old Raoud Saradin survived one of those harrowing boat rides with her family. I would just look at, around me at the sea and nothing helping me to be safe. But when I'm looking up, Allah with me, no, I am safe. <laughs> Fatima, her husband, and 10 children also survived a dangerous journey by sea to reach Greece. They arrived with nothing but their lives. <laughs> And though their circumstances in Greece are extremely difficult, Fatima believes her family is still better off. Behind each one of these people is a whole world, a whole life. And you learn in a hurry that God really loves these people and really watches over them and he honors their prayers. Paul Steed ended up volunteering for six months at Moria because the Greek ministry asked him to run the camp. He relied heavily on prayers and volunteers. 
they would save up all of their vacation time and come and work. Like this group of Mennonites willing to tackle the toughest jobs. I mean horrible jobs. And they said, well, the way we feel is, is that we read the scriptures just to get a little inspired, but then we set them down and we go to work. Every time the camp ran out of supplies and reached a critical point. And the first thing you'd think is, wow, a whole bunch of people are gonna suffer. But then, Somebody would show up with either a container load of stuff or, or uh, the, you know, the Greek police called up and said, we have a whole warehouse full of donations, come and get them. Deborah Steed arrived to help her husband at the camp on Christmas Eve. We got to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. And in return, refugee children gave her all they had. It was this little, faded, tiny little rose about this big, made out of cloth. And that was my Christmas present. Moria Camp held within its confines infinite need. But the Steeds say there was also a powerful feeling of gratitude. It's very raw. Lots of experiences. You, you can't even start to imagine what it's like being with those precious people that are in their time of desperation. One of the toughest and most tender experiences came when the Steeds helped a couple bury their child. I was asked to assist to be the companion of a little Islamic woman whose baby had frozen to death in the tent. You can't imagine uh, the faith these people have over losing their little baby, that, that he's back with God. While they witnessed great tragedy, the Steeds also witnessed many miracles. Something we can parallel that we, I've learned from working with the refugees and over here is that just normal people can do extraordinary things. I think there's a temptation to lose God when you see people that are suffering so unnecessarily. But this crisis in so many ways has brought me so much closer to God by just knowing that, that God loves every single one of His children. Coming up... Utah is a very unique place. A call to action results in overwhelming support. See the unique ways Utahns are helping refugees. It is our hope that you will prayerfully determine what you can do according to your own time and circumstances to serve the refugees living in your neighborhoods and communities. In the last 40 years, Utah has welcomed 60,000 refugees from more than 20 countries. Utah is a very unique place, and, and I say this because I see how our community is helping the refugees. Aidan Batar is the Utah Director of Immigration and Refugee Resettlement for Catholic Community Services. So tell me about February, these are the families you have. The agency settles the majority of refugees in the United States. 43 new arrivals mm -hmm. and one Cuban. So it'd be 44 total. And Batar says Utah leads the nation in providing services. They're from mm -hmm. Iraq, uh -huh. uh, Pakistan, Kenya, Congo. Maybe. When it comes to volunteering, the services that the refugees receive, and also the high level of self-sufficiency, the refugees that are in our community. Batar estimates that 90% of the refugees in Utah are able to become self-sufficient within six months because of jobs like this at the LDS Church's name? Humanitarian Center. Every year they take about 100 refugees that they can Hello. learn English for four hours and also four hours they, they gain uh, employment skills where they will be trained. Integration within the community is another key need. Families that have volunteers will become more uh, uh, successful than those that don't have volunteers. Right now in Utah, there is a waiting list of volunteers willing to mentor refugee families. We never had this support that we're seeing uh, for the past uh, year. Because so many people answered the LDS Church's call to help. But there are still ways to get involved. People, what they can do, they can go to the airport to welcome the new refugees. We give them a banner that shows the refugees' names and they say, welcome so-and-so to Utah. It's kind of like missionaries coming home. 
Donation drives and advocacy are also needed. The more uh, advocacy we can do, the more we can tell our congressional leaders that we as Utahns, we can take more refugees to help them because this is what our community wants. Lots of people within the community are coming up with their own ways to help. Some of this too, the stuffing, bread. From sharing meals, to clothing drives, and getting ready for a good bike day. Keep your feet on the ground. Tom Daniels and his neighbors collected bikes for refugees. It just takes each of us to share a small part to make a tremendous difference in these people's lives. Amy Chandler felt it was important to give refugees a sense of belonging. So she and her team of volunteers helped them create their own personal storybooks. When somebody sits down with you and looks you in the eye and says, you matter, and I want to know all about you. There's just a power in that. And there's power in simply being a friend. ESL teacher Stephanie Hunt created the Family to Family program at Clayton Middle School. We just decided this is the way you can help. You're going to get paired up with one family and we want you to be friends first. Now, dozens of Hunt students are spending time together. I'm so happy to be here at Second Middle School. It really has been fun to get to know each other and see how um, different lives we have. And their lives are intersecting at school and at home. We have so many good things to, that has brought us here tonight. Clayton families gathered one night earlier this year at the Park Place Apartments, home to many refugee students. The generosity and the acceptance and love that you guys have shown, and we're so grateful. The community support was very helpful for us at that time. Batar credits his neighbors for helping his own family transition to life in a new country. When I, I came to Utah, you know, that was the first time I ever traveled to a Western uh, country. And uh, uh, even though I knew English and, and educated, it still was a culture shock. He was one of the first Somali refugees Catholic Community Services resettled in Utah. We wanted a, a new place where we can raise our family and to start a new life. More than two decades later, it's still difficult for him to talk about his decision to flee. To even experience the life of refugees one day. The refugees are survivors. They, they go through this harsh conditions and yet survived. Um, and when they come to the United States, they make better life. Better lives, especially for their children. Batar's son recently graduated with a master's degree from Columbia University. Refugees, all they need are love and compassion and be given the opportunity to, uh, to, to start and to build their life. Any support that we could provide them to achieve that goal uh, would be really helpful. Still to come. They don't want to believe they're going to be here for a long time. A closer look at the realities of living in a refugee camp and the Latter-day Saint woman giving them hope when To the Rescue continues. Seasoned members of the church who have given years of service and leadership attest to the fact that ministering to these people so immediately in need has provided the richest, most fulfilling experience in their service so far. Dick and Judy Winwood. We still need to get magnets and white bar markers. Check to make sure they packed all the items on their list. We've got all these t-shirts to take uh, and we need to get those in each of these bags. They're headed to Greece to volunteer in a refugee camp. We felt compelled on the basis of uh, Elder Karen's uh, talk to go. He said, being a refugee does, will not define the refugee, but how we react to the refugees will define us. And I thought, that's the person I'd like to be. Besides a desire to help, the Winwoods have a personal connection to Greece. My father came from a very small village and uh, they were very poor. Judy's father immigrated to the United States from Greece, so she empathizes with refugees. It was a challenge for them to come here, and, and I know a little bit of what they probably uh, feel. I have to put those on top in case the customs people wonder what I'm trying to do. I, I, I know that, that we're going there for a purpose. Once we're on the ground for a few hours, we'll know why we're there. It didn't take long for the Winwoods to figure out their purpose. We've made very good friends with some of the people here and given them some hope. 
This is Oinofita Camp, located in an abandoned warehouse about 45 minutes north of Athens. Being a part of their lives for the past two weeks, I, they're just like you and I. I don't, I don't see any difference. The Winwoods were put right to work fixing fences, handing out food. Stop, there you go. That's how I get The camp relies heavily on volunteers like the Winwoods. This has just an added a new dimension to our lives that really is a wonderful thing. I'm, I am so, I, I am so glad we came. Look at this. Another volunteer? We do distribution out of the warehouse. Jess Webster came over from Vancouver, Canada. I wanted to do something good and I was like feeling stuck. So the, so the reason that I came to Greece was like as much for me as it was for like to help like everybody that's here. Webster says she's frequently moved by the residents' gratitude and generosity. They don't, they don't have a lot here even if they're better off than in a lot of places. But still, they are so, so giving. There are a lot of single men in this camp. Somebody the other day just came up to me and said, Jess, I'm, I'm alone. And he was crying, and he just, just that like overwhelming feeling of just being by yourself. Keeping the men busy with jobs around the camp helps combat the depression. There aren't many camps that are like trying so hard to get people to get involved and to stay active and to com like to help combat things like depression. The camp's mission to help people help themselves comes from the woman in charge, Lisa Campbell. Is Alex doing the movie night, Alejandra? I think so. Okay, so he sh he won't have his radio on. She's a Latter-day Saint from Virginia. Very nice. I like the new duds, dude. And runs the camp through Do Your Part, a nonprofit she co-founded to aid people during disasters and crisis. As you can see, we're taking down all the tents, getting all that cleaned up. Campbell wears many hats. This space will eventually be our women's space. The Manager. But it's nice to see you all here. Advocate. The biggest we want to go in a room like this is a family of six and only if they have little kids. Consoler. Oh, mama, congratulations, Mubarak. And comforter. Here. Congratulations, mama. Oh, he's smiling for me. <laughs> but it's also like being mom to 650 people, OK? It truly is. And this is his cute sister. Every day, she operates at that difficult intersection where hope and reality collide. You know, the, the hope is hard. The hope is hard, but I, I tell them all the time, you know, live while you're here. Live while you're here. That is Campbell's main goal, to help these people live with dignity, because most face an indefinite wait for permanent relocation. They don't want to believe they're going to be here for a long time, but I am real, and I know that they're going to be here for a long time. Some of the men in this camp were forced to flee their countries because they acted as interpreters for the U.S. So we couldn't uh, leave anymore in Afghanistan because we were very, very well known. This man still fears for his life, which is why we're protecting his identity. He describes his journey to Greece. It was a very difficult situation for my family because we had been passed two, three times in a very big river. Another resident, Ali, lost his leg in a terrorist attack when he was a teenager, but he still managed to walk 4,000 miles from Afghanistan to France, often carrying his nephew on his back. They have made the most difficult decision and choice to leave their home and their country to find something better. When Campbell arrived in Greece, she only expected to stay for a few weeks. We were going to plant some gardens, and, and that was it. But she quickly recognized she could do more. It seems like everything that I've learned and done in my life has led to what I'm doing here. I use skills that I never thought I would need. I use knowledge. You're getting the door. Yeah, thank you. This needs to come down. Okay. Campbell modeled yeah. this camp based on principles similar to those of the LDS Church's welfare system. We never just give a hand out. We give a hand up. Residents run their own hair salon. Obviously, you see they've come in and decorated it. And sewing center, both made possible by donations from LDS charities. This coming week, we're going to start making tote bags out of some of the old tents. 
The first building Campbell renovated was a school. To have a community feel, to not have it be a camp. And she used paint to transform the stark gray walls and people's attitudes. I know it sounds crazy. Residents initially resisted the invitation to paint the walls. We don't have doors, we don't have ceilings, and we don't need any painting. But with each brush stroke, hearts changed. There was less discord. People came out of their rooms, started visiting, and made more of an effort to get to know other residents. For so many of us, being able to be creative helps us to become happier and to to look at our situation differently. And that's what them being able to paint did. Now, under the toughest of circumstances, a community does exist. But the people here still need to know they're not forgotten. So doing things that makes them realize a lot of people do remember and care has been really important. Still to come, I often feel a bond with someone when I'm drawing them or painting them. See how Latter-day Saints are using their talents to give voice to refugees when To the Rescue continues. As we consider the pressing calls of those who need our help, let's ask ourselves, what if their story were my story? Germany, more than any other country in Europe, has opened its doors to the great wave of refugees and migrants. Since 2015, more than a million people fleeing war and turmoil have arrived. I think it also has something to do with a country that has known war on its own soil. Parks, fairgrounds, and even schools became havens for people who had lost everything. I immediately thought, wow, that's, that's something I can help with. American expat and Latter-day Saint Trisha Lemer handed out meals, played with children, and helped with language classes. I can look these, these, some of these people in the eye and I can say, I've, I know, German is hard, and I've been here for 16 years. As a foreigner herself, Lemer understands how hard it is to adjust to a new country. I know what it's like to really worry about going to the grocery store because you might not be able to understand what the teller is asking you or the, the cashier is asking you. So does another expat, Melissa Dalton Bradford, who got the youth in her Frankfurt ward to volunteer. And I said, we are going to serve these youth. You kids in our international congregation, you know what it's like to show up in a new country and feel frightened. She also understands the heartbreak of unimaginable loss. Her son, Parker, passed away when he was 18. We are connected where we are most broken, and that little part of me that has felt pain and that has been broken connects when I look into the eyes of a father who's separated from his children and a mother who is separated from her husband. Through their volunteer work, Bradford and Lemer began to realize that if more people could make connections with refugees, hearts would change. When they become human beings and you know their stories, you are changed. You know that you aren't talking about an other, you're talking about your brother and your sister. They teamed up with Latter-day Saints in Seattle, Utah, and the UK. I have asked myself, what, what can I do? What can I do that would make a difference? To create their story is our story. I want to help tell the stories of some of these people and put a human face on this refugee crisis. The project gives individual refugees voice through social media, exhibits, publications, and art. They love to be drawn. Liz Thayer sketched portraits in German and Greek refugee camps. I often feel a bond with someone when I'm drawing them or painting them. She plans to exhibit her paintings to draw attention to the refugee crisis. This is the first painting she completed. I just thought it was a beautiful scene. Um, and the, for me, the water, the source of water was a little bit symbolic of the hope that keeps them going. Hope is the only thing many refugees have left. One day his oldest child, who was about four years old, was kidnapped um, by this terrorist group and um, they sent a ransom note, but before they could respond or do anything about it, the child was killed and delivered back to the doorstep. Um, and his face, as he was you know, telling the story, was, I didn't know what to say. Each story, personal and powerful. They largely have had their agency taken away because of their circumstances. Ahmed, an Afghani antique trader, was shot twice in the feet as he struggled with his seven children to cross the borders. Firuze wants to be a doctor and misses school and her grandparents more than anything. 
Ahim's piano was burned in the street and his life threatened. He was forced to leave behind his wife and two young boys and flee Syria. When people view the painting, they can listen to his music. Thanks to the painted QR code. Probably one of the things that most affected me on our whole trip was listening to him sing about his home, about Syria. In my family, it's not a safe place. Nobody's safe in Syria. I've had a lot of memory from the, the music. Now I play a lot of pain in music because I have pain. Pain and grief. For so many refugees, it needs desperately to be shared. There is something very powerful in, in sharing tears with one another, even though we don't share the same language. I was amazed at the stories of bravery and fidelity and faith, families traveling together, incredibly inspiring stories and amazing people. And the Latter-day Saints sharing these stories believe they have the power to change attitudes all over the world. And it's my job to crank up the volume as much as possible so that anybody that wants to listen to them can hear them. Coming up, the race to help those in critical need. Imagine living out in this and that's what we're trying to help with. Truly pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to look to the poor and the needy and administer to their relief that they shall not suffer. Imagine living out in this. Heavy snowfall. That's what we're trying to help with. Record low temperatures. Um, it's been insane. We have been working nonstop since we None of it stops Haley Smith. She and her team raced to gather supplies for the most vulnerable refugees still stuck on the island of Lesbos. A lot of them don't even have jackets or boots or even shoes, um, so that's what I'm thinking about. Thanks to generous donations, many of which came from Latter-day Saints, they were able to purchase desperately needed items. Uh, we left during the big storm to go to the mainland to fill up on as much aid as we could. We were able to collect 1,300 sleeping bags, a few hundred tents, hundreds of pairs of trousers. Ooh, it is cold. This is one of just countless missions Smith's nonprofit Lifting Hands International has carried out over the past year. It's been really hard to see all the suffering that I've seen. She's seen and heard a lot. Smith, fluent in Arabic, volunteered as a translator during the early months of the Greece refugee crisis. This is my house. <laughs> she wanted to help in part because learning Arabic helped her during a difficult time in her own life. And it plucked me out of my really dark place and it just threw me into a completely different world. Smith changed her major, studied abroad, and eventually became a high school Arabic teacher. All of those experiences helped her create Lifting Hands International back home in Arizona. The nonprofit provides clear and meaningful ways to help refugees both in the U.S. and abroad and got a major boost when Relief Society General President Linda K. Burton announced the I Was a Stranger initiative. Smith's main focus in Greece is providing vital services for a camp of 500 Izidis from northern Iraq. It is one of the only official genocides of this whole conflict. So ISIS killed thousands of people. For months, these tents in northern Greece have been their home. As winter set in, they were temporarily relocated to apartments. The horrors of war are still felt every day. When? The Sinjar? Smith consoles a young woman who just received devastating news. Her friend in Sinjar was killed yesterday, probably by ISIS, decapitated. You hear these stories every day. To help the refugees cope, a volunteer from Ireland offers massage therapy. Holding the neck of somebody who's come from a trauma, traumatized background compared to somebody who knows they're safe but just feels exhausted is, is a completely different experience. Smith's small team also delivers fresh food. This is military, subsidized military food. To supplement army rations. It's not very good. <laughs> They teach language classes, make hygiene kits, 
and provide another key need, friendship. And I wasn't expecting so much the happiness that I'd have with like the residents. The moments like that I would have with them of just like laughter and play. <laughs> Volunteer Tana Fowler came to Greece from Lehigh, Utah. And it amazes me when I think about what they've been through and that they're still able to have like so much of that positivity. Spencer Smith came from Salt Lake. He wanted a chance to understand the situation firsthand. It's an opportunity for me to, to understand the culture, but to see the people and understand their situation and, and to provide humanitarian service. Soon these families will return to the tents and an uncertain future out of their control. The kids are so perfect. The lack of choice and lack of control is one of the biggest problems. All over Greece, thousands of refugee families face an indefinite wait for a permanent home. Yeah, they, they hold on to hope so much for their new countries. So I really respect their strength and their determination. Coming up, lifting hands on the ground in Arizona. I just feel like I've been really blessed to um, meet, meet people who have been through um, really hard things. See how a group of Mormon moms are helping hundreds of refugee families build a new life in a new country. My beloved sisters, we can be assured of Heavenly Father's help as we get down on our knees and ask for divine guidance to bless His children. Heavenly Father, our Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are ready to help. Saturday morning in Chandler, Arizona, and members of two LDS singles wards are busy lifting. Can we get one of the guys to put this into the truck for me? Moving. Will you talk to her about getting some, down some towels? And building inside a donated warehouse that belongs to Lifting Hands International. Right up above is our mother's kits, and they're filled. their diaper bags and backpacks. It's packed with furniture, yep. household items, and toiletries, all collected to help refugees begin their new life in America. There was a backpack drive done um, for at the beginning of the year. This operation is run mostly by Mormon moms. So I lived overseas with my young family for a few years and I saw how difficult it was to learn a new culture. I think a lot of people feel like they need to have special degrees or different things, but God really has blessed us all with different skills with different talents and, and they're really meant to bless our brothers and sisters. Christina Atwood is the director. I got called to go up to girls camp for my state to do the service project and um, so I had the girls decorate these canvas drawstring backpacks and I started praying that Heavenly Father would send me somebody that would be able to connect with the girls and that's how I found Haley. Haley Smith was just getting lifting hands off the ground. Christina had also been inspired by Sister Burton's talk. It's extraordinary to get to work with people that you feel called to by God in a different way, like as sisters in a community, and it has forged some of the most beautiful relationships. Since July, Lifting Hands has helped more than 450 families and individuals resettle in Arizona. Well, our family today, they're from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but they've been in a camp in Tanzania and have set up and furnished more than 100 awesome. apartments. We want them to feel like they're at home and we want to welcome them to our country. This year they'll likely help resettle at least half of all the new families coming to Arizona. There's no better feeling than feeling like you made a difference in somebody's life and you get to see that difference. These moms seek not only to serve refugees, they also want to connect. This is yogurt. In a tube. <laughs> Around this table, two mothers and their children gather for a Sunday meal, sharing food and friendship. It doesn't seem that the language barrier <laughs> has a lot of, um, it's not quite a barrier for children. They just run around and play. Pam Fisher met Zubaida Mazajub through Lifting Hands Adopt a Refugee Program. I just feel like I've been really blessed to um, meet, meet people who have been through um, really hard things. Uh, things that I can't really imagine in my life, but that have a spirit of um, hope and, and a spirit of really 
uh, faith in God. Zubaydah's family fled Syria in 2011 when the civil war broke out. They faced a lot of adjustments when they first arrived in Arizona. At first I was afraid to leave the house because I've heard that sometimes maybe Americans aren't as friendly towards Muslims as, as we would like, but it's been amazing. People have been so kind to us and um, now I'm not afraid to leave the house at all and I have friends, American friends, and I really appreciate them. Pam also appreciates the new friendships, especially the influence they have on her children. They've gained an exposure to people that are from a different place than them, that speak a different language than them, and have a different um, religious beliefs than them, but that they're able to see how much we have in common and, and how much, um, how easy it is to show love to other people. All right, guys, let's Emily Davis's family has also been blessed by helping refugees. Start going through some of these clothes and organizing them. It's brought us together. It's given us um, a common mission. Her kids and their cousins have been heavily involved in service projects. I had a bake sale and I raised $25 for the refugees. I help my dad and two other boys unload furniture. I gave a refugee girl my bike. Together, they as a family set up and furnished an apartment for a family from Afghanistan. The greatest blessing from this whole experience of helping refugees is it's got us out of our comfort zone. We went into parts of the city that we weren't familiar with and met people who spoke different languages. And even though we have like a hard time communicating with them, you can still tell they're so grateful for everything and they're just so happy to be here. Emily has also found that serving refugees has helped bridge gaps within her community. We have volunteers um, that are Jewish and I know there have been many instances where we have um, members of the LDS church working with Jewish ladies to build um, a home for a Muslim family. And that, to me, that's beautiful. People of many different faiths turned out for a Syrian sweet exchange at a Methodist church in Tempe, Arizona. Pam Fisher and her children came to support Zubaida. These are my kids and this is, this is my friend Ash. The program helps Syrian refugees bake and sell traditional treats. I was so excited about coming today just to get a sampling. And also introduces them to a wider community. The Syrians need to know other people here. They need to start like learning English, learning how to adjust to the newest place. Their families are all different. Their stories are all so different but there's a pretty common theme or element of suffering. There's also a theme and common element of hope, and hope is my swan song. The ladies of Lifting Hands say they've each witnessed miracles. And the miracles are small and sometimes insignificant, but when we look back at the end of the day, we find blessings and people along our way that are constantly helping to lift our spirits. And they're constantly reminded of God's love for all of his children. I've just marveled at how God is aware of these people. When Christina set up that first refugee apartment, she witnessed a powerful example of that. I hear this chatter, and I'm trying to figure out if it's a happy chatter or a sad chatter, and I run out, and the parents are both crying. Their little boy had discovered his new bike. And they were crying because they shared that every day for two years, their little boy had prayed that someday they'd be able to go to America, somewhere safe, and if only he could have a bike. I have seen how I can walk through the warehouse and I just say a little prayer, Heavenly Father, what does this family need? Because he knows them, he knows what they need. And he knows who can help fulfill that need. Bended knees, an open heart, and a willingness to serve have led many on a life-changing path. I don't think we'll ever look at our lives the same as we used to as we've gotten to know these families and recognize the blessings. Next, it's the universal language we all understand. See how music has created new friendships between Latter-day Saints and refugees in Austria when To the Rescue continues. We must be careful that the news of the refugees' plight does not become commonplace when the initial shock wears off and yet the wars continue and the families keep coming. 
Millions of refugees worldwide whose stories no longer make the news are still in desperate need of help. Vienna, the city of music and the new home to thousands of refugees. In nearby Graz, Latter-day Saint Warner Mao has created Afghan Youth Voices of Peace. So I try to contact them personally. I visit their house. I talk to them to know their stories. Their first concert was held at an LDS chapel. I'm very happy in this concert because I can share my culture in this country with Australian people. This is also the first time our church choir singing with uh, the choir from other countries, so they are also very excited. They performed the song Safe Harbors. I feel this is the right song we need to sing in this concert. While Mao conducts, he knows that God is leading, asking each one of us to reach out and lead those who are suffering to safe harbors. Ahim Ahmad has found his safe harbor in Germany and was eventually able to bring his wife and two children over from Syria. He now performs all over Germany to raise awareness for refugees and last summer had the opportunity to meet another world-renowned musician, Mormon Tabernacle Choir organist Richard Elliott. I, I think we both agree that music is not something that, that man invented. Music is something that came from, yes. from God. Raoud Saradin and her family have resettled in France. Her sisters are now enrolled in school. I want my sister to see the good thing in this world. I want her to, to live a normal life. I tried signing up for camps, but... Haley Smith continues to run Lifting Hands International and speaks to community groups around the country. I hold on to hope because I know Heavenly Father loves all of his children and I know he has commanded us to help. No matter what our polit political, cultural prejudices are, we have to help. Crystal and Steed Brown now works full time with Help Refugees in Greece. I've just had a wonderful opportunity to learn from so many people from so many different religions. You know, I, I always joke with my Muslim friends, but Mormons and Muslims are actually quite similar. Like, it's really surprising how similar we are. Focusing on refugees has helped Christina Atwood face the unexpected challenge of her husband's job loss. It's just provided balance in our lives and recognizing our blessings and I don't think we'll ever look at our lives the same as we used to. Adam Steed is connecting U.S. families with families living in refugee camps. I had no idea that the most important things I would ever do for refugees would be done right, right here. He created the website Wally.org. It stands for We Are Like You. Once paired, families use social media and Google Translate to communicate. We're on WhatsApp. Deanna DeBry of Salt Lake City connects with a mother stuck in a Turkish refugee camp. She says, hello, Deanna, and she shows pictures, oh, so cute, shows pictures of these children, and one of the little girls is, is clutching a doll. If we can set that example for our kids, you know, we may not save the world, but we've, we've saved our family, and we've saved their family. It really is fascinating that, that uh, they can be so distant, and yet we can have a personal relationship with them. It is these kinds of personal connections that will ultimately make the biggest difference to those who are rescued and those who come to the rescue. This is a call to arms, to reach out.
safe harbors of the heart.